for their controls, and then we'll uh, we'll hand it over to Dr. Khan. Hey, Dr. Omar, did you bring your selfie stick? My selfie stick is always ready, man. <laughs> it's like a VR selfie stick or something. Yeah, check this out. Here, let me bring it up. Um, where's must? Hey, Dr. Khan, turn, uh, turn around for a second. Yeah, let's just go up to him. Oh. <laughs> oh, That's I great. Love it. <laughs> Look at that. Dr. Khan, you got your first selfie in the metaverse. Yeah. It's awesome. And I got to make a better app. <laughs> I'm gonna hide this one up there, James. We can have it later. Do a photo shoot. All right. Cool. Okay. <laughs> uh, funny. Uh, here, look. These models of knees and stuff, and I'm excited to learn what they are. <laughs> Dude, they're pretty cool, huh? All right. Oh, I see that stuff here down at the bottom. Hello, everyone. Can you see me? All right. So if you guys are on your computer, uh, um, you can use the Q, W, and E keys to kind of move forward and turn right and left. Um, if you use Q, it turns you to the left. E turns you to the right. W walks you forward. And S walks backwards. Um, if you're on your cell phone, it's a little bit, it kind of, you know, a little bit. All right. There we got one follow. It's definitely a learning curve to get your VR legs, I will admit. Yeah, it is. What do we got back there? Hey, Alejandra, hey. how are you? All right, welcome, David. And we have Cedric joining us right on. What's up, guys? Okay. Oh, perfect. Hey, how's it going? So, guys, these two ramps on the side here, if you just, you can, you, you can either walk forward with your arrows or click to where you want to go, and it'll take you up. So you'll come to the top of the stage here. This is, you know, a, a new initiative that Dr. Omar and I are working on trying to, you know, bring medical education, medical training into the virtual space. And I, while it's in its infancy, I think we have a lot of, uh, a, a lot of. Hey, 
hand it over to Dr. Khan. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, uh, I specialize spe specifically in uh, different types of plasma injections and stem cell injections. So that's exclusively what I do in my practice now. Um, I've kind of built it over the last few years. Uh, for those doctors who know, it's, it's hard to build a practice exclusively on that because it, it is private pay. But uh, because of social media, I've become, uh, get, you know, patients from all over. And so I do, I do almost like, you know, 40 or 50 injections a, a week. So I'm quite busy and I have a lot of experience. So I'm hoping to share some of the insights. And really the theme of my talk is to get across the fact that there's this huge treatment gap in chronic pain and injuries that we're not addressing with the traditional model, uh, the traditional model being physio, cortisone, and surgery. Uh, so there's kind of a treatment gap between those patients who aren't quite bad enough for surgery and aren't getting better with just physio cortisone. And so it's like, what do you do with those patients? And there's a lot of those type of people. Uh, and so that's kind of what I want to focus on. So we'll go over, uh, so basics are basically what I went over, but essentially understanding the different types of injections, which uh, we'll talk about like the adipose drive stem cells, like the fat, the different types of PRP, uh, and then we'll talk about some of the technical. Did X amount over baseline. That's that's like a very general definition, but it's it's really more about what's the cytokine profile and what are the different messenger cells that you have in your platelets, um, and what you'll come to learn is that, and what we've learned over the last few years, especially, is that depending on how you process the PRP, so depending on the RPM, like how much, how long you spin it, um, how fast you spin it, do you, if you freeze it, if you incubate it, this could have all sorts of different effects on the platelets and affect the outcomes because it, it affects what are, what's called the cytokine profiles. And cytokines are little messenger cells that communicate when you inject them into the joint or into the tendon and tell and send signals on how to either reduce inflammation or increase inflammation uh, or recruit other messenger cells. So the cytokine profile is really what's important. Um, and that's why I don't like the word PRP because it doesn't really tell you anything about the cytokine profile. It's a very generic term. So that's what we're trying to work on in the field in general is like teasing out which studies have actually differentiated between and standardizing the type of cytokine profile versus the ones that didn't. And you'll see that the literature is mixed because the studies didn't actually tease out what the cytokine profile is, those studies are usually not well done and those are usually have poor results. So it's not that PRP doesn't work, it's just that if you use the right type of PRP for the right indication, it tends to work quite well. And I've had, you know, I've had amazing results treating people for, you know, hundreds, of, I mean, thousands of different uh, patients, but just almost almost every condition you can think of when it comes to chronic pain, like spine stuff, nerve, nerve things, obviously osteoarthritis, tendon issues. So, there's a wide label use of PRP, but you have to have the right type of PRP in the different types. And um, and most people, unfortunately, don't have access or don't even know that there's different types. So uh, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. So this is just like an overview of kind of the inflammatory process. You can see if you have too much inflammation, um, it can cause degradation of the village and, you know, eat, eat away at uh, cartilage over time. And that's kind of what leads to... Oh, someone just missed the thing <laughs> so uh so basically you, you want to have you don't want to have too much inflammation because that's what leads to degradation of the joint um and so we want to put out the inflammation and so there are certain ways we can do that by ta targeting specific cytokine uh markers so like il1 or mmps um and that's kind of what we're trying to do with the next generation of plasma it's become more specific and targeted um and so i think most people want understand that PRP helps people return to further and that's where really where it's claimed to fame uh, came from was early on when we were getting athletes back to return to sport and Dr. Dahlia who's my mentor he was the first one in the world to do it he did it back in 1999 for uh, uh, Olympic gold medalist named Donovan Bale from Canada uh, he had an Achilles tear and he had, a, he had to compete in Olympics in six months it's like a full rupture and usually if you have a full rupture it takes a year to get back to full running uh, he was able to get back to running and performing at, at the Olympics in six months with PRP. Um, and so that's really what started it all. And from there, it's kind of taken off and been used for a lot of different things. But it all started with the early return to sports. Uh, and this is kind of the evidence I'm talking about. Is, I mean, there has been actually a lot of randomized control trials. But I, I think if you look at them, the reason why the data is mixed, it's just what I was talking about, is the cytokine profiles it's not being standardized. Um, and so when you're not having standardization, you're going to have a lack of uh, essentially like 
validity because you have such variable results from PRP profile, not because PRP per se doesn't work, it's just because what type of PRP are you using? Um, and so, so I think that's where we need to come back into uh, coming up with a better term. So maybe as a, we can think about this as during this list. If someone can come up with a better term than PRP, it would, it would be much better. But it's, it, it seems like everyone loves to use that term, but it's, it's so generic and it's, it doesn't it doesn't mean anything. It's like saying I had, you know, I had pizza for dinner. It's like, hey, what type of pizza? <laughs> it, it, you need to specify. Um, and this is just to give a little bit of more evidence on osteoarthritis specifically. There's been research showing that PRP and hyaluronic acid injections together are actually more effective uh, than PRP alone. And so uh, that's what I often do. Uh, and then this is just a another slide to explain uh, what we talked about earlier. Uh, basically, there's different preparations, extraction, and there's so many different variables, variability in terms of how they're preparing therapy, and that's the reason for the variability as opposed to um, PRP in itself not working. It's a type of PRP and using it for the right thing. And the problem is a lot of people are using the wrong type of PRP for the wrong things, and then obviously this is not going to work. So, for example, there's something called leukocyte bridge P, which is more pro-inflammatory, uh, and then there's some studies that are using that for joints. It's, why would you put pro inflammatory PRP into a joint that has cells in it? The cells can cause disease and actually lead to more inflammation. You actually want to put out inflammation. Uh, so it doesn't make sense even mechanistically as to why they're doing that. But I think a lot of those people running those studies just don't have good training in PRP and they just think, oh, we'll just use the side bridge because that's the, you know, it's the centrifuge we have. Um, and so that's, that's the problem with that. So that that's comes to Cytorich, which is kind of, um, it's our own proprietary product, but there's also one called uh, Genokine or Orthokine in Germany. And then there's also platelet lysate, uh, which is a Genix product in the U.S. Essentially what those products, all platelet lysate products, essentially what they're doing is they're modifying the uh, profile to more specifically target those inflammatory mediators I talked about earlier. So specifically Cytorich, what it does, it targets IL-1 so, um, and also MMP. So as it has uh, interleukin receptor antagonists, and then it also has something called PIMPs, tissue inhibitor metalloproteinases. So essentially what it is in those cases is specifically targeting those inflammatory mediators that cause chronic inflammation and pain. Um, so it's much more general, it's much more targeted than something just leukocyte or leukocyte rich RP, which are just a very generic cytokine profile. Um, and that have more growth factors than actually anti-inflammatory cytokine. So, so that's really the big, Big difference, and I, as biologists expand, expand, and now therapies really become cool because you actually engineers to target specific pathways, and that's kind of what they're doing. With cancer. They're using amino therapy where they actually target specific pathways, and I think that's the future of biologics. We're going to, to engineer cells, uh, and then use those to target the specific pathway that we want to put out. Um, and it's similar to even stem cells. Um, so this is kind of just explaining. What I was in the visual form, what I was trying to, what I was saying there about the tissue inhibitor metallokinesis and uh, the IL-1 RA. So essentially, this is just kind of the idea with the knee. You have these inflammatory mediators that are going to destroy the joint, and you're basically trying to put out fire. So think of the inflammation like fire, and then the, the biologic we're using is like a fire hose. Uh, it's specifically targeted to put out this type of stuff. And uh, yeah, and that's essentially more of what I just kind of explained already in the words. So this is an interesting slide because it gives you, because you guys are sure everyone's heard of stem cell injections. So when you get a stem cell injection in in, in America, at least, and, and Canada, and now you do that as well. Um, so basically, if you're getting it from your bone marrow or from your fat, and you just inject it, it's not really a true stem cell. It's more of what's called a medicinal signaling cell or an anti-inflammatory immunomodulator. So what that means is basically it's working similar to a, like a cytorich or the kind in that it, it's reducing inflammation. So it's not really regrowing new tissue because you don't actually have a lot of stem cells in there. Um, the better term for it is the best term I've heard is called a committed regenerative cell. So meaning the bone or the fat you take, they have some stem cells in them, but they're committed to turning into you know, so a fat or bone, just meant to turn into tendon or cartilage. So they don't really regrow cartilage too well, or regrow tendons uh, too well from uh, from uh, from themselves. They do what's called paracrine secretion, where they send cells to your own endogenous stem cells, 
to help with reducing inflammation, to help with some regeneration. But the regenerative effect is rather mild, mainly anti-inflammatory. But the anti-inflammatory effect is quite powerful and it lasts for a long time. The reason I'm comparing it is just because the cytorich anti-inflammatory profile is fairly similar to BMAC. Um, in experience with both, though, BMAC does last much longer. Uh, it can last for several years, whereas our side ritual is for one to two years for um, osteoarthritis. Um, and that's where it's just kind of about the assessing and our clinical trial with the side ritual that we're working on. Uh, we have a large trial in the States going on right now. Uh, it's about 5,000 patients across a few different clinics in the U.S. Uh, and once that's done, hopefully we'll have FDA approval. Um, we have all kind of approval, but we don't have the FDA approval yet. So then once we move it there, then we can start uh, other things that are performing centers as well. Um, yeah, so this is cool because hopefully we can get you guys now a little bit more interactive. And if you guys, we could show you guys how uh, what's called an osseous sneak, where we actually inject the plasma or the cider rich or the stem cells directly into the bone. And this is actually quite, quite a quite an amazing discovery because when you inject it into the bone, the results are much longer lasting. Um, when PRP lasts at least two to three years or longer, and then with stem cells, there's a study showing it can last up to a decade. Uh, so that's quite amazing. Uh, you know, then you're, you're getting into kind of a joint replacement territory where you're, you're having results for a decade and longer. Um, and that's just from one, uh, one stem cell even to the bone. So maybe you guys um, uh, uh, this can help us with uh, showing you guys a little bit about how we inject into the bones just to kind of see what, how that's done. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to demonstrate that. Um, so if you guys want to direct your attention towards the middle of the stage, um, you'll see that we have three different models here. And these are models of knees. And um, as you can, if you come get a closer look, we have three knees here. On the left, we have a knee that demonstrates uh, mild arthritis, so mild degradation. In the middle, we have a knee that demonstrates moderate arthritis. And on the right here, you could see that we have a knee that demonstrates pretty severe arthritis. And I think the hallmark feature between all three of these is that you'll see certain structures. You know, the patella is, is, is pulled away here. And you can see cartilage. You can see uh, meniscus. You can see, you know, here's the tibial plateau. Here's the medial and lateral condyles. And you can see the difference between the mild one where everything looks kind of smooth and nice, cartilage is intact. You look at the severe one here, everything is kind of degraded. And you'll notice that if I come over to the side here, you'll notice that there is bone spurs and, and things sticking out here. Now, what you can't really see on the model, but is often associated with severe arthritis is swelling inside the bone itself. And that is a marker for severe arthritis. And what Dr. Khan is teaching us about is that there are ways to actually inject your own tissue into the bone, into that area of edema to promote healing and, and resolution of that, of that edema. Dr. Omar has the syringe here. And so if he wants to come up here and kind of demonstrate what it would look like to give this yeah. injection. All right. Bang. Bang. <laughs> so, and there's, there's a number of iterations. It, it really depends on, on where the edema is. And so, in, in a lot of instances, you know, what I'm, let me come to a different knee here. Let me, let me move this thing here. I'm just going to move it. I'm going to come there. I'm going to blow it up. There we go. So if you take a closer look at this knee, you'll see this structure up here that I'm pointing at. This is called the lateral femoral condyle. And it's like a bony knob that is integral in, in the movement of our knee. And so what Dr. Khan and his team will do is using a combination of a specialized type of needles or even bone drills, they'll actually, they can actually inject into the condyle under either uh, x-ray or ultrasound guidance, in this case, x-ray guidance, and inject it right in that area of edema, match it up with the MRI and, and track uh, its results. Dr. Khan, was that a, was I able to demonstrate that all right? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. So exactly what he said. So, so this is a combination of precision medicine and regenerative medicine. And the, the interaction 
too is really the future of what we're doing. So we're using, like you said, an MRI to plan exactly where the bone edema and inflammation is, and we're going to slightly inject into that area with our targeted therapy. Uh, so that that's and that's the way it should be, right? So it's all about targeted and precision, not uh, not uh, you, you know things guided or just doing them like as we leave with the, uh, people unfortunately still. So so yeah. And then, uh, so in terms of stem cells, we're talking a little bit about, uh, you know, BMAC, which is a bone marrow aspirate concentrate. Um, there's also something called adipose dried stem cells or microfragmented plaque graft. Uh, so based on, you know, the best of the evidence and researchers, um, the fat does tend to be a better source of stem cells. Like there are more stem cells in the fat. Uh, and there's actually being trials done. We're actually, I'm, I just got uh, some done for Health Canada for stem cell trials. So we're actually doing one right now. Uh, we're comparing DMAC, bone marrow aspirate concentrate, which is stromal vascular action, which is a fat fraction that has cells in there for osteoarthritis. So we're just actually starting to study. Um, and there have been a few other studies done. The results are kind of, you know, some show superiority with BMAC, some show fat. Um, based off basic science, the fat that have more stem cells in there. But again, we talked about how it's more about paired distribution and the uh, inflammatory effect that's mainly responsible for the effect. So it's still, it's still hard to see which one's the best, but um, I think in terms of uh, what the experts in the world are doing when it comes to stem cells, most of them are using fat as a primary source. Uh, so for example, uh, I'm gonna be doing culture and expanded stem cells and exosomes in the eye because we can culture and expand them over there and we're gonna be using fat. So we use it, we take the fat and we harvest it and grow the stem cell for two or three weeks and then we isolate the exosomes, which are like the goodies inside of the stem cells. Um, and those goodies are basically all the anti-inflammatory kind of sacratone or cytokine profile that we were talking about earlier. Um, and the good thing about that is they're acellular, so there's no uh, of having tumors or anything like that. And then you can even use them IV. Um, so you can even do IV exosomes for ceramic and uh, inflammatory conditions. Uh, so it's going to be some cool stuff I'll be uh, able to play around with in Dubai that I can't do in uh, Canada, which is a uh, success to help people you know, with chronic inflammation, which is such a big problem for the different uh, diseases. Uh, so this is just to give a good overview of like the regenerative and triad or principle. Um, so it's basically three things. You have to have regenerative cells and you have to have a scaffold and you have to have growth factors. That's what is true regeneration. So if you guys get a said word, you know, inflammatory quite a bit. So because those stem cell inhibitors are more anti-inflammatory, if you really want to regrow to you, you have to have a scaffold and you have to have uh, stem cells in addition to growth factors. So that means what that looks like clinically is using 3D bioprinters uh, where they actually print the scaffold and then seed it stem cells which have growth factors and aerosol in there. And then that way you can actually resurface an entire joint and regrow new cartilage. So it's like regrowing organs. And they've actually done that in the University of Washington. Um, they're doing a clinical trial that, and it's, it's actually pretty amazing stuff. And I think that's really what's going to be the future of um, regenerative medicine in terms of orthopedics. It's going to be growing cartilage and resurfacing joints using the bioprinters. Uh, the way we do it uh, as a now, what we can do, for, for example, tendon or muscle tears is we can use um, we can use that as a scaffold and then can put uh, the PRP uh, with the fat. And so we kind of have that triad to regenerate muscle and tendon tears. Uh, but obviously, we can only do that to a certain amount of size of muscle tendon tears. Uh, they have to be within, you know, a centimeter and a half. Uh, but if larger than that, then typically need surgery. So eventually, hopefully, once 3D bioprinters become more accessible, then we can use that. We can just 3D bioprint the scaffold, collagen scaffold. Typically, they use a um, like hyaluronic add polymer, and then you see that with the stem cells and growth factors. So it sounds science fiction, but it's actually happening. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to have a lab in my and we'll push the field forward with this stuff. So it's exciting field to be in. So, yeah, so I kind of want to uh, just go over some of the details, go over cases, because that's, you know, cases are the best way to kind of understand what we really do and, you know, the benefit it can for people. Um, so, yeah, go into them, though. Is there any questions? Let's, you know, we can go into the questions uh, now and go over some cases. I'm sorry, did you ask if there's questions? 
Yeah, like I asked before I wanted to go in before I made a lot to digest. So I gotta figure it out if there's any issues before we start to talk about some Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I think one of the questions I have um it's something that I, I encounter in my clinical experience a lot, and it's um it's when I'm trying to explain what you know what these therapies are to another physician who is maybe not as familiar with it or as well educated on it or maybe even has a predisposition that it's like you know kind of kooky but they just don't have the data how do you you know what what's your approach for for telling other colleagues you know about the power of this this therapy uh, uh i think the biggest thing is just um, like honestly, case, like cases like me, I try to share those and uh, try to publish case reports and, and show them evidence. And uh, a lot of it's just ignorance because they don't realize how much the field has evolved in the last few years. Uh, it's the last five years. And, like that research in stem cells and therapy is exponential. Uh, so I don't think it's that they they want what's best for their patient. And if you tell them that you know, therapy has you know, potentially no harm, there's a lot of potential upside. I don't think why they would not put their patient through surgery, uh, which has been actually, it may not work either. Big surgery for the most part has pretty poor evidence. Uh, so why not try something less see? And to me, there's the harm versus benefit. And the harm, this type of stuff is pretty much nothing. And a lot of potential benefits. So that's the way I explain it to most of my colleagues. And usually they're, they're like, oh, that makes sense. Why, would I, why wouldn't I try this first before trying surgery? Um, so I think that's the, that's the dialogue I usually have. It's not, uh, I don't, and then I always uh, let them make their own, like, either, you know, make the doctor or the patients make their own decision. I never, I never tell them they have to do this. Tell them this is an option, and you could do surgery. Surgery is going to have more risk for it, um, and this is going to have less risk and potential side. So, and most people are willing to try it, uh, for, but when you explain to them, like, like that. I see. Thank you. Um, by chance, or, um, if you can, I don't know if you're using like Bluetooth headphones or something, but if you, if there's any way, you, you're kind of breaking up a little bit. Um, if there's a way to maybe try and speak directly to your device or, or maybe find like a Wi-Fi connection or something. Sorry, I just had a poor connection there. Is this better? Yeah, it's a little bit better. Yeah, so um, can you hear me okay? It's still a little bit choppy, to be honest. It seems okay, okay when Dr. Uh, Gaddis is speaking, which is, I think, why we uh, feel it may be coming from your end. Yeah. Uh, there's me. Is this... I can... Let me reconnect my headphones. And see if I can get better. Yeah. 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 Can you uh, hear me open? Can you try it without your headphones, Dr. Khan? Because I believe I can tell that it's uh, the connection of your headphones going in and out. Oh, I see. Above okay. your head, I can see you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Give me a sec. Okay, one sec. In the meantime, um, if anyone has any questions or anything they want to add or comments, just raise your hand or give me a clap. We can unmute people and get people talking while uh, Dr. Khan just troubleshoots for a sec. Something I find really interesting about this, about this, you know, whole realm in general, is that, you, you know, amongst the professionals, there will be a lot of debate, this for that, you know, bone is what's best, bone marrow aspirate, fat graft, you know, some people are big proponents of amniotic tissue. Um, even amidst PRP, there's a lot of debate with what concentration is, is correct. And I just think that when you have all these different variables, 
I feel like that is just ripe for research, ripe for data. There's going to be so, like, we're going to see a renaissance. I mean, we're already amidst a renaissance in the orthobiologics realm, but even more so now. Uh, I just feel like um, we've moved away from the stage of, hey, let's just inject this tissue into a joint and see if it helps. And we're moving towards, hey, can we, we know it works. Can we tailor treatments to a specific patient, you know, if a if a 34 year old athlete walks in the door, they're going to have a higher yield of, you know, uh, mesenchymal stromal cells versus you know a 65 year old guy who smoked for 30 years. So, you know, are there ways for us to tailor and develop the treatment to get the best outcomes? I, and I, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, new developments in that realm pretty soon. Yeah, that's a good point, Dr. Yeah. Gettis. Um, how are you doing there, Dr. Khan? Hello. Can you make a question? Yeah, go ahead and ask that question. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Wait, give me a second, please. Then my computer is kind of having trouble with the audio. Now, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Okay, I wanted to ask a question. Um, for example, someone um, who is pretty young can have those knee troubles even when there's no exposure to much physical work. And sorry for my English, I'm I'm not really good at it, but I'm trying because That's for, okay. You're doing I, right. I came here basically because I saw all the the knees uh, models. And it seems really great. And I wanted to ask if, for example, someone who doesn't make a lot of exercise or whatever can suffer from these uh, troubles in your knees, like out of nowhere, can be a condition, uh, a genetic condition, or is something that is caused by something? Yeah, I mean, Dr. Uh, I see a lot of, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's so interesting thing actually. Is my audio okay now, by the way? It, it, it's still rather, uh, it's, not, it's coming Chunky? in kind of digital. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, maybe one of you can answer that and then I'll, let me just reconfigure. <laughs> yeah, I, I can answer your question. Um, so if, if I understood you correctly, you're wondering, you know, in someone who is, you know, not exposed to a lot of, physical exertion or like physical labor, things like that, can they get degeneration like this in the knee? Absolutely. Matter of fact, motion and activity is probably the best way to avoid getting this kind of degeneration. And oftentimes we see that it's patients who are sedentary, that they don't move around, they lead an inflammatory lifestyle with potato chips and hamburgers and things like that, that they start to get this kind of degeneration early on in their life. The other kind of less typical scenario that we see this is in younger individuals who are like athletes or, you know, working aged people who do a repetitive job over and over and over. They tend to get a lot of breakdown in these joints. And th those kind of those types of injuries and those types of patients, they tend to respond very well to treatments like this because they have a lot of life ahead of them. You know, a, a 15 year old or a 30 year old. You know, they still have a whole lifetime of work or productivity or, you know, work in front of them. And so when the traditional treatments like steroids and surgery, while they may help the pain, they actually accelerate the generative process. The nice thing about orthobiologics is you might get pain early. What happens is in the long term, you have better healing, regrowth of tissue, improved function. So those people tend to do a lot better in the long run. Did that answer your question? Yes, it, it was a perfect answer. Thank you. Awesome. And Dr. Khan has some cases he's going to present to us today, too. So it'll, it'll show us a, a variety of ways that um, people with various pathologies can, can be treated and how they present to certain clinics. Let's give it a whirl, Dr. Khan. Yeah, I hope my audio is better now, but I don't know. <laughs> is it, is it, can you hear me okay? 
Love. Yeah, it's a little bit better. I mean, we, we can we can make it. Yeah, what are you saying? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so this, you know, so just to give uh, I think that's the best way to kind of see and demonstrate what we do. Um, so yeah, this patient, uh, well, he had kind of classic severe arthritis, um, and he was actually booked for a knee replacement. Uh, so he came to me right a few months before, and he said, "Is there anything else I can do about the uh, And at this time, I, I, had, I wasn't doing intravenous injections. I was just doing the side injection before, and essentially got rid of a hundred pain, and he was able to get back to functioning. And he had canceled his knee replacement. So, and I haven't seen him since. This was about two years ago. So, uh, I'm guessing I'll we'll see him again in the next couple months or a year. Because uh, usually it does wear off, but it's you know at least for him it was also delayed in the knee replacement, and I'm hoping this time around I'll do either intraosseous uh, PRP or stem cells for him because uh, that will last much longer. And uh, yeah, this is uh, you know kind of a classic case of someone hurt themselves in the gym, um, and they had a meniscus tear, which. Classically, is we'll say you have meniscus, you need surgery, you have to get surgery. Uh, but the reality is, for a lot of meniscus tears, uh, we can fix them without surgery. And uh, in this case, we just did a series of three PRP injections, kind of like a standard PRP. Uh, and I said, again, they were like 100% better after six weeks. And uh, we avoid surgery. And the evidence for meniscus surgery isn't really great. In Canada, they can Canada, they actually delisted it. So what that means is the government actually stopped covering meniscus surgery. So they're they're actually telling people not to get surgery anymore. Um, they're basically just saying physio and basing. Uh, they have embraced PRP here, so you still have to pay for it. But um, I'm hoping one day they'll, they, you know, the insurance providers, people like that, actually cover it. Uh, but yeah, just another case of avoiding surgery because. You know, otherwise, patients, as soon as they get a meniscus tear, the family doctor will refer them to the big surgeon. The big surgeon will be like, the surgery, that's it. And then you're just kind of, you're kind of just told that you're going down this rabbit hole, but you don't realize the meniscus is actually a cushion in your knee. And so what that means is shock absorber. And so if you take out a cushion, you're going to have increased risk of arthritis. And we know, you know, based off studies, there's anywhere between 100 to 300 percent increased risk of arthritis down the road. So that's, that's a very significant increase. And so if you can avoid getting arthritis in the road, um, definitely what we want. We want to preserve your joint as long as possible, not accelerate the deterioration. Uh, and that's what, that's what we're, what, that's what we're all about what we're doing. So, this is a cool case. Um, if he has chronic bias pain that no one could figure out, and all the imaging was actually normal. Uh, since there are a few things in here, um, this is what this could be. I'm sorry, can, can you just outline that one more time? Yeah, sorry, so I was saying got... that he has like this chronic bicep pain. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, so chronic has pain in the middle of the biceps, anterior, uh, and cortisol shot with those surgery, then he tried physio for two years, uh, and all the imaging was normal. So just wondering if anyone knows what the diagnosis is before I tell them. <laughs> Hmm. Uh, I mean, the first thing that I have a question: Does this patient have any sort of atrophy of, of the bicep, deltoid, or, or pectoralis? No, no atrophy, but pain. Just pain with uh, doing bicep curls in the gym mainly. So, it sounds like a biceps tendinopathy to me, but the imaging is normal. So maybe, yeah. maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. So it's interesting. So it's actually he had musculoskeletal nerve entrapment. Um, so the muscles, you know, nerve when they get trapped, they can cause pain. I mean, sometimes they're really damaged, they can cause neurological symptoms. But in this case, I mean, he's, I think he said he had some pain, but he, he made it that it was really just pain. And so we just dissected the nerve once, uh, you know, using, um, we actually just use a combination of like dextrose and saline and a, like a baby dose, of course, is what I use. And just like, and then he got 100% pain free uh, for the first time in three years. And, that, and he hasn't had issues since. So it's a pretty cool case of, um, just like a 
you know, again, using um, like our own kind of concoction of uh, to kind of treat this issue. You know, that's so, really amazing because, um, you know, we often see, you know, patients, like let's say that patient came to an interventional pain clinic and they weren't necessarily well versed on MSK therapies or even orthobiologics. And they're, they're telling me that they have pain and a, you know, a C5-6 distribution, they may end up getting an epidural steroid injection instead of, you know, instead of treating the, the actual injury or even, you know, an intra, intra-articular steroid shot and then, you know, we miss the diagnosis entirely. But something as simple as just hydrodissection using prolotherapy and saline and maybe even some PRP and they get tremendous relief, I think that's amazing. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's funny because I'm a peak surgeon. He went to for uh, me this cortisone intraticular and adding into his bicep tendon as well. It's just, you know, I think the orthopedic surgeon just had a radio white west, so he's just like, let's just inject cortisone and see what happens. Um, which I get, sometimes you need to do diagnostics, but obviously, you know, wasn't able, like, that's, that's what I think. It's just um, the orthopedic just gives you such a different perspective on things. As. So yeah, so um, so this is a uh, you know like a classic case of a large rotator tear. Uh, rotator cuff tear is one of the most common things we see. You know, it can affect your, it can really impact your ability to work out, to really live your daily life, just reaching over painful. Uh, and in this case, we uh, we did a we did a back graft, so like the scaffold I was talking about, and then we seed it with ERP, uh, and then essentially you know uh, six follow up, most of the tendon was generated. And then 12 weeks, we did follow up, and the, the whole tendon was generated, and she was like, this injury, and back to full training. Uh, and uh, she's been great ever since. So, again, soon regenerative medicine to regenerate what otherwise would have been a surgical uh, tear to repair. And the problem with tears, again, they're not they're not regenerate, they're not fixing it per se. They're just sewing it back together. So the re-tear rate, the re-tear rate for uh, rotator cuff tears are actually really high. Uh, whereas the fat graft studies that have been done and follow up, the, there's been very low repairing or none at all. Um, and the patient I've done for the most, like I've, I've only had one patient re tear, and he was just a big builder doing stupid things. But other than that, like I've never had anyone re tear. I think that's a, an amazing way to demonstrate, you know, when you're using something like fat graft, uh, that you're demonstrating homologous use of that tissue because, you know, fat's original use function is to provide a scaffold, to provide a structure, cushion. And so by taking that fat graft and injecting it on a full thickness tear, providing that scaffold for that tear to heal, I mean, it just, it's like beautiful harmony, you know? You're using homologous use, it fits well within all the regulations, and then they get incredible results. Yeah. Well, I mean, people love it. Like, it's a surgery, they're, they're back to what they want to do, and it's, ama- and it's amazing for us, obviously, as doctors, to just get, like, restore their life. Um, yeah, and then... Yeah. yeah, and then that case here uh, of uh, this was an interesting. Actually, published this, this case just published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. Um, this is the first uh, intraosseous PRP case in Canada. Uh, obviously, like, how's the doctors to do it? And uh, so, a basically, what he, he had like severe pain. He was a carpenter. He had a remote history of a fracture in his toe when he was younger, and I guess he just developed post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Um, and this is affecting his like his job really because he's on his feet a lot. And uh, so I did intraosseous plasma injection as we were talking earlier, where we drill or we drill the plasma directly into the bone. Um, and essentially, so I did that and I did uh, two intraocular into the joint injections because that's the protocol. Uh, and then essentially after he was like after like two or three weeks, he was 100% pain free. And ever since then, he's never had any pain. Um, so it's, it's amazing what, you know, again, what you can do if you target the right area. did have on an MRI, he had severe bone edema. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm not even, just for the sake of doing it, I'm doing it to target a specific issue. Uh, and it was, so again, the results were amazing and uh, he's super happy and he's uh, back at work and doing what he, you know, doesn't have to worry about his pain anymore. Uh, and spine, I, you know, obviously I have to talk about spine just because spine is, uh, uh, you know, the most uh, debilitating condition and most chronic disease burden on society in terms of costs to society. So, uh, uh, basically, spy, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, this patient here had chronic pain for many, many years. Uh, I think it was more like seven years, actually. And so, she had a lot under MRI, which a lot of 
memorize, you can find genetic writings and all sorts of stuff. But based off her clinical exam, uh, I thought more her facets. And then I also we also found a paraspinal muscle tear based off uh, you know doing a diagnostic ultrasound in our clinic. So we use our own high resolution ultrasound, um, and so we treated the PR with we treated the muscle tear with our standard PRP, and then we use a Cetaridge to treat the facets for inflammation. Um, and then she, you know, this is kind of the pain scale. Six weeks, she was four out of ten. And then after 12 weeks, she was two out of ten. So she went from an eight or nine out of ten to about two out of ten. And she's been there. Um, so I saw her again uh, for a six hundred follow-up just to see how she's doing. And she's been doing well. And she's back in yoga and exercise. And she's happy. Uh, so it's, uh, it's amazing to see the results with someone who otherwise was kind of told to just live in chronic pain. You know, if, if I can yeah, add something just, to that, um, yeah. it's, it's pretty interesting because you know, Dr. Omar and I, we just finished our interventional pain fellowship. And the, the kind of going convention now is that injecting into the facet joint is like, like old, old news. And the rationale is that the facet joint, like the actual synovial volume is too small for medication to make any difference. But here we are, we can inject, um, you know, the patient's own healing factors into their facet joint. By the way, for those of you who don't know, the facet joint is the joint that uh, are, are, is a series of joints in our spine that permit all the motions that we like to do, like side bending and extending and things like that. And those joints, they often get riddled with arthritis and they get inflamed and very, very painful. And so by injecting PRP into those tiny, delicate little joints, you can actually reduce the inflammation, promote healing, and like Dr. Khan said, you know, improve function. Yeah, I think I think that model it comes again. It comes from like that traditional cortisone model. I think cortisone um, is not maybe it won't have much benefit, but if you with the orthologic, uh, uh, I think different potent and uh, and again we're, the problem with the pain model too, the traditional is very reductionistic. It's like saying there's one pain generator and let's just target that. Whereas in reality, like her too, she had muscle tear that you know then muscle tears really get picked up on MRI. Uh, we have to kind of find that ourselves based off palpation and our own exam. Uh, so there's there's often multiple pain generators, and um, the only way to treat that is the biologics because you can't you can't inject cortisone and block it everywhere. So yeah, so that's basically uh, you know uh, over, uh, over of everything that I'm kind of doing, and uh, I think the big takeaway is really you know just doing the procedure that's the least harmful and has the potential most benefit. Uh, based on that, build evidence, and I think orthobiologics fits that role right now. Um, and I, I can only see it going based off how much research is being done. There's going to be more demand for it from patient side, uh, and more practitioners doing it as well. I totally agree. I mean, along those same lines, something I'm very excited for is um, treatment protocols to address degeneration in the functional spine unit. So, two vertebrae, a disc all the intervertebral ligaments, ligament yeah. flavum. Um, I think by targeting that as a functional unit with a combination of prolotherapy, PRP, bone marrow aspirate, or fat graft, um, I, I think you're going to start to see a lot of people not needing surgery and really, you know, enjoying their life, not being relegated to bed or a chair or what have you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I'm excited about is that, uh, Doing that, fun, yeah, I've been doing the functional spinal unit approach for the last uh, couple of years, and it's been amazing. The results have been amazing. Like for some people, it's just life changing. So um, it's just it's about spreading the word and getting people on board with it. Uh, I'm excited to use actually exosomes for in Dubai because they're a uh, cellular product, which is, which is great, uh, and they're super anti-inflammatory. So I think they'll be great for spine for spine. Could you just real quick, because I think we only have just a few minutes left, but could you tell us a little bit about exosomes? What is that? Because I hear that term being thrown around quite a bit. So, yeah, exosomes are a class of extracellular vesicles. Um, so extracellular vesicles are just um, basically messenger cargo cells that go around in the body and just different types. So there's micro vesicles um, and then uh Exosomes are just one type of extracellular vesicles. So exosomes are the smallest type. And the reason they're getting so much hot topic is because of the secretome. So the secretome is a kind of a biological milieu of different uh, messenger cells. And the exosomes carry a lot of those anti-inflammatory ones. But also not just anti-inflammatory, 
but also um, immunomodulating and anti-aging. Like they, they have to turn on certain protein proteins that are involved in aging as well. Uh, so the exosomes are quite remarkable and it derives them from stem cells. Um, so they're basically called adipose derived stem cell like for, so exosomes. So that's essentially what we're doing is we're isolating the exosome from the stem. And the reason we're doing that, you're probably why do you need to isolate them is because they're acellular. So there's no, because the problem with injecting fat or bone marrow into the, for the spine, for example, or into the loins, is that there's always, a, there's always a chance of having a tumor or having something go wrong fat after fat because you're injecting cells. So I was actually reading, um, there's been a couple of studies done, uh, one out of Colorado and another one done by Hernigo. They did these two massive retrospective studies where they examined, you know, uh, tumor occurrence in patients who have gotten orthobiologic treatments with either BMAC or, or fat graft or even amnion. And they actually had a lower rate than the general population of getting cancer either at the injection site or even remotely. So I think that's well, a nice sign of go. relief there. Exactly. So I think, I think it's a theoretical. Um, I just, I just, for me, but mechanistically, I guess it makes more sense to use a cellular product because you don't want to do anything that may trigger um, any sort of inflammatory response in a joint, at least, because you can have, you don't want disease or cells to build up in the joint. I, I totally agree. And I, and I think the other thing about acellular products like exosomes and even amnion is that there's, there's a practicality to it. There's, there's, it, there's an economic value to it because let's say for whatever reason, you know, your patient has blood clots or has a history of stroke and can't come off of their blood thinning medication in order to get a bone marrow aspirate or go through one of these kind of harvesting procedures. Well, you can at least offer them this acellular product knowing that they're going to confer benefits from it as well. Yeah, exactly. So it fills a gap. Um, so I, I think we're going to see exosomes really take off in the next couple of years. That was amazing, Dr. Khan. I, I, I really appreciate it. It was very, very detailed information. Does any, while we're wrapping up in these last few minutes, does anybody have any questions? Keep in mind that if you're hanging around, if you're wearing an Oculus, um, I can see if, you know, come take a look at the models. Our design team did a very good job of, I can, and yeah, you, you know, this, again, thank you guys for, you know, taking time out of your day. Dr. Khan, we want to thank you for, you know, taking time out of your busy schedule to come give this talk and on a, on a very different platform, nonetheless. Yeah, um, uh, so, thanks. It's cool. Thank yeah, and you know what? Thank you so much, we're, Dr. Khan. That was awesome. Clapping? Okay. We're all getting our VR legs, too. So as time goes on and we keep doing this every week, we're gonna, it's going to get a little bit smoother. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we can, uh, we can definitely do another, another one in the future and, you know, some more time advertising, too. And I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's a cool, really cool thing you guys have. So. And, uh, you, you know, for everyone here, we hope uh, uh, you pick up a little bit on the potential implications and, and the advancements of having a stage like this who powers uh, in Virtuo. Uh, and there's all kinds of topics for, uh, in, for people with all kinds of interests. So check those out. Um, you can find us on Instagram, Twitter. Um, we're pretty, pretty much everywhere, yeah? All right. Yeah, I just opened up a TikTok for us too, so... I, uh, I'm going to need someone to teach me how to TikTok. It's a whole different world. <laughs> it's another world. Yeah. But um, if you guys, you know, if you want to tune in tomorrow afternoon at 12, our, our uh, Sunken Blimp, our kind of parent company, they host a talk similar to this that is in the, you know, design, architecture, you know, crypto and, and 3D printing realm. So very interesting topics that they have there, too. So be sure to tune into that as well. All right. Uh, okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I like how people are dancing. It's cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dr. Khan, do you have, like, the name of your practice that I can share with all the, the audience? Oh, and he's gone. Oh. That's all right. We can share it with everyone gone like the wind okay all righty 
Well, thank you again, everyone. Take care. Have a good night. Thank you.